Hello everyone, and happy Halloween. This video is a Halloween special, as it's one of the most gruesome true crime cases I know of, and the final murder took place on a horrifying Halloween night. As you may or may not know, I've had extreme difficulties putting out content lately, as well as basically functioning due to some extreme mental health crises I've suffered recently. Therefore, for the time being, I decided to focus more on my premium content, that way I can establish more foundation for my family, as well as hopefully eventually take a break. If you'd like to help out or support me directly, all the links are in my description for my premium pages, that way you get content to you as well. There's also a GoFundMe if you decide to look at that, but there's no obligation. Between June 24th and October 31st of 1979, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris would kidnap, torture, and murder five teenage girls in California. The two would become known as the Toolbox Killers as they would torment their victims using tools you would typically find in a household toolbox, such as pliers, hammers, and screwdrivers. Bittaker would be described by FBI Special Agent John E. Douglas as the most disturbing individual for whom he has ever created a criminal profile for. The toolbox killers would go down in history as some of the most disturbing serial killers in American history. Roy Norris was born on February 5th of 1948 in Greeley, Colorado. A product of premarital sex and his parents were quickly married to avoid the stigma of bearing a child out of wedlock. His childhood is not well documented but from what is known, it is clear he, as well as his future partner in crime, endured rough childhoods. Norris primarily resided with his mother, who was described as a neglectful drug addict, but would try to find reprieve when staying with relatives, many of which stayed close to him because Norris's grandfather's real estate investments. But he was repeatedly placed in foster care families throughout the state of Colorado, where he cited much abuse and neglect primarily at the hands of a Hispanic family, allegedly, who he would blame much of his future prejudice on. He was an awkward kid, making inappropriate jokes and conversation at the worst times, and generally making others feel uncomfortable. He struggled to form friendships and even worse social interactions with the opposite sex. By 17 years old, Norris would join the Navy, and while he would spend most of his time stationed in San Diego, California, he did spend four months in Vietnam, but never saw combat. While stationed in San Diego, Norris would attack his first known victims, however he would not kill them. The first woman he assumed to be parked alone in her car, when Norris approached and tried to force his way into the vehicle. He was charged with both rape and assault, and attempt to commit rape. Three months later, in February of 1970, he would attempt to trick a woman into letting him into her home. When she refused, he attempted to break into her house. The police were able to intervene before he could hurt her, and Roy Norris was arrested. Less than three months after this offense, Norris was diagnosed by military psychologists with schizoid personality disorder, then given administrative discharge from the Navy under terms labeled as, quote, psychological problems. While on bail for this offense, Norris would stalk, then assault a San Diego University student. He attacked her by slamming a rock into her head over and over, until she fell to her knees. He then struck her down to the ground, kneeled on her back, and smashed her skull into the concrete. Norris was charged with assault with a deadly weapon, and he was committed to five years imprisonment at Oscadero State Hospital where he was classified as a mentally disordered sex offender and was released after five years when he was deemed of being no further danger to others. It appeared Norris's attack cycle was around 90 day intervals as only three months later, Norris strangled a woman to the point of unconsciousness and then he raped her. He told her that he was about to do it and what he was about to do and out of fear, she did not fight back. For this offense, Norris would be identified as the attacker later on, and he was then arrested for the rape. One year later, 
He was tried and convicted for this offense and sent to the California men's colony in San Luis Obispo. There he would meet his partner in some of the most disturbing serial killings in American history. Lawrence Bideker was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on September 27, 1940, to a couple who chose not to have children, so he was quickly put up for adoption, and then adopted by the Bideker family. His adoptive father, George Bideker, worked at aircraft factories, forcing him and his parents to move around often. He grew up in four different states before his family finally settled in California. Allegedly, this lack of attention and care from his parents, due to their heavy workload, presumably, is what drove Bideker to petty crime like theft throughout his early life. And despite having an IQ of 138, he would drop out of school at 17, more or less claiming it to be a waste of his time. At some point, he was sent to a California Youth Authority for auto theft, hit and run, and evading arrest. He served three years for that offense then. He was arrested again when he stabbed a supermarket employee in the parking lot of the business. Bideker stuffed a stake down his pants and tried to steal it. The employee chased him out of the store and tried to retrieve it. So he was stabbed. The man survived and Bideker was convicted of attempted murder. He met Norris while in prison at the California Men's Colony. When he was sent to San Luis Obispo, his life changed and so did his criminal habits. Norris and Bideker became close friends very quickly and while incarcerated, they divulged their deepest fantasies of sexually torturing and murdering women. And this shared fantasy evolved an elaborate plan to murder one girl of each teenage year, ages 13 through 19. The two made a pact to enact these fantasies when they were released. Three months after Bideker was released from prison, on January 15th of 1979, Norris was released from prison and moved into his mother's home in Redondo Beach. Not even a month after his release, he raped a woman whom he then abandoned in a desert. He then soon found employment as an electrician in Compton. Shortly thereafter, he received a letter from Bideker. And the pair made arrangements to meet. And by late February, the pair met at a hotel and rekindled their plan to kidnap and rape girls. Bideker bought a gray 1977 GMC Vendura in February of 1979. The vehicle was windowless on one side and had a large passenger sliding door. The two would nickname this van Murder Mac. And the idea was that they could use the sliding door and drive up and simply snatch girls into the van. The pair would spend February through most of June of 1979 picking up over 20 girls hitchhiking, but they did not harm them in any way. These were practice runs, and it shows the pair meticulously planned their soon-to-be-murder spree. They had found an isolated fire road and cut the lock of the gate, replacing it with one of their own for future use. And they just got done constructing a bed in the back of the van. Underneath it, it had a storage compartment for their tools and even a cooler for beer and soda. They had no set routine as they combed the beaches, drinking and smoking weed and planning their first murder. And at some point, the pair found 16-year-old Lucinda Lynn Schaefer on June 24th, 1979, who was last seen leaving a church meeting in Redondo Beach. After failing to go her certain to the van, the pair eventually drove beside her and enacted their initial idea of snatching a victim. The volume on the radio was turned up high to muffle what would happen next. Her legs and hands were bound, and the toolbox killers would drive to the fire road they discovered earlier, and then they would take turns raping Lucinda Schaefer. Then they got into an argument over how she should be killed and who should do it. She pleaded for a moment to pray for death, however Norris began to manually strangle her. After approximately 45 seconds, he became highly disturbed, perhaps in his inexperience, and then he retreated to the front of the van to vomit as Bideker finished her off. He strangled Schaefer until she collapsed to the ground and began convulsing. He then twisted a wire coat hanger around her neck using pliers until Schaefer's convulsions stopped. 
she was denied her request to pray. Her body was then thrown over a steep cliffside and wrapped in plastic in hopes animals would eat it. Not even two weeks later, the pair would find their next victim. On July 8th of 1979, two weeks after the murder of Schaefer, Bittaker and Norris found 18-year-old Andrea Hall hitchhiking along the Pacific Coast Highway. As the pair slowed the van to offer her a ride, another vehicle pulled over and offered her exactly that, and she accepted. Bittaker and Norris followed the vehicle from a distance until Hall exited on Redondo Beach. This time, Norris hid in the back of the van in order to trick Andrea into thinking Bittaker was alone. He was able to coerce her into the van and that's when Bittaker offered Hall a cold drink from the cooler in the rear of the van. Norris then pounced on her when she attempted to retrieve the drink and after a fight, managed to subdue her by twisting her arm behind her back, causing her to shriek in pain. Norris then gagged Hall with adhesive tape and bound her wrists and ankles. Then they drove to where they raped and murdered Lucinda Schaefer and raped the girl three times. But after a close call with another vehicle in the area and spotting headlights, the pair decided to move on from the road. Bittaker forced Hall to walk uphill naked along the roadside and then to perform oral sex on him before ordering her to pose for several Polaroid photos. After more torment and moving to a third location, Bittaker would take two more Polaroid photos, but just of the girl's facial expressions, he wanted to keep her face captured in terror, if you will. Bittaker then informed Norris that when he returned from buying alcohol, he told Andrea Hall that he was going to kill her and challenged her to give him as many reasons as she could come up with as to why she should be allowed to live. Amused by her panic, he surprised her by shoving an ice pick through her ear into her brain, then turning her body over and shoving the ice pick into the opposite ear, stomping on the handle until it broke. Somehow still alive, they would finish her by strangling her, then throwing her body off a cliff. Bittaker and Norris would not kill again until September, and on September 3rd, two girls, 15-year-old Jackie Gilliam, a 13-year-old Leia Lamp was sitting at a bus stop bench near Hermosa Beach. They'd been hitchhiking along the Pacific Coast Highway before the toolbox killers would spot them resting at the bus stop and offered them a ride. They unfortunately accepted. They smoked weed with the killers and eventually realized the van was driving in the wrong direction. They attempted the fight back when Bittaker and Norris gave excuses, but were quickly subdued. Leia was knocked unconscious by Norris, who hit her with a bag of weights as she tried to open the van door. Jackie was easily restrained, but Leia regained consciousness, and a struggle ensued. However, the girls would not escape, and both were restrained with ease. These girls would be held captive, raped, and tortured for nearly two days before being murdered. Bizarre acts of torture were enacted with Jackie as the focus for most of Bittaker's abuse. She was made to pretend to be his cousin and her nipple was ripped off with pliers, her breast stabbed with an ice pick. She was killed similarly to Andrea Hall, stabbed in each ear with an ice pick and then strangled. Leia Lamp, however, was made to exit the van, then Nora slammed a sledgehammer into her head. However, before he left, her eyes shot back open and then she was strangled to death by Bittaker as Norris beat her continuously with the sledgehammer. Their corpses were then again thrown over an embankment. The two would claim one more victim in their depraved spree, and arguably it would be their worst instance of torture inflicted upon a victim. And it happened on Halloween night. The toolbox killers would abduct their final victim on October 31st of 1979, 16-year-old Shirley Lynette Ledford, as she was hitchhiking home from a Halloween party outside of a gas station in Los Angeles, California. Exactly how she was coerced into the murder mac is unclear, but the common belief is that Shirley accepted an offer for a ride because she recognized Bittaker, as he was a regular at the restaurant she worked at as a waitress. 
What happened to Shirley would go down in criminal history as one of the most horrific acts of torture inflicted upon a victim and recorded. She was bound at knife point, beat, and then mocked by Bideker in the back of the van as Norris drove aimlessly around secluded streets. Bideker would beat Shirley with a hammer and punch her breasts and make her dodge the hammer out of terror. He verbally mocked her and encouraged her to scream, and at some point, a tape recorder was turned on, and the audio of her torment is allegedly so horrific that the FBI still uses it to desensitize its agents to this very day. So, still want this job? While the audio was never made public, a snippet of it can be heard during the televised trial hearings of the killers as people fled the courtroom in disgust. The first half of the recording was of Bideker torturing and raping Shirley. This includes sodomizing her with various tools, including pliers. The next part is of Norris doing what in my opinion makes the entire case one of the most disturbing murders ever. Intentionally fumbling in the toolbox to instill terror into Shirley, Norris then slowly raises a sledgehammer in the air. The fear described by the transcript in this incident alone is chilling. Oh no, she says before the hammer comes down and strikes Shirley directly on the elbow, her bones shattering upon impact and this is repeated approximately 25 times. Her torture lasted two hours of continuous rape and agony until Roy Norris strangled her with a wire coat hanger. Shirley, broken from her abuse, hardly reacted to her demise and did not fight back. She did die with her eyes open, and the pair decided it would be amusing to gauge the news reactions by throwing her corpse on someone else's residential lawn, which they did. The following morning, it was all over the news, and the body was found by a jogger. The autopsy revealed that in addition to being sexually assaulted, she died of strangulation after blunt force trauma to the face, head, breasts, and her shattered elbow. Her genitalia and rectum have been torn apart as well from having tools shoved inside her body, as well as the violent rape. Bideker would claim in court that the recordings were merely evidence of a consensual threesome, and it was so good that she begged for them to kill her. I just never heard anything like that in my life. I, I've never heard screams like that. I, I don't know. Between Bideker and Norris's apartments, hundreds of Polaroids were found of over 500 different girls, only 60 of which, other than the five victims, were identified, and they were found unharmed. It is unknown if the killers claimed more than five victims. On February 17th of 1981, Lawrence Bideker was found guilty of five counts of murder, five counts of kidnapping, nine counts of rape, one count of conspiracy to commit those crimes, two counts of foral copulation, one count of sodomy, and three counts of being an ex-convict in possession of concealable weapons. Soon after, he was sentenced to death. Roy Norris, having pleaded guilty, was sentenced to 45 years to life.